right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Miko Getchev. I'm an engineer in the Angular team at Google. Today, I'm going to be talking about a couple of tools that we have been working on over the past few months, which aim to help you build faster Angular applications. So let us start with the agenda. We're going to discuss what is network performance. I believe most of you are already familiar with this, but we're also going to introduce a couple of tips and tricks which you can directly take from this presentation and introduce in your applications in order to make them faster. After that, we're going to discuss how we can efficiently deploy Angular applications to production just by using the Angular CLI. So network performance. The network performance is the time required for your application to get downloaded in the browser, pretty much. So we can optimize the network performance of our app just by reducing the number of bytes that we're transferring over the wire and uh, reducing the number of network requests that we're also sending. A couple of tools that we have been working on, they aim to, sh to, to help you ship fewer bytes of JavaScript because it turns out that JavaScript is more expensive than some other assets. For example, Adius Mani in his survey, The State of JavaScript, he shown that shipping 170 kilobytes of JavaScript is much more expensive than shipping 170 kilobytes of a JPG image, about 20 times more expensive because of the overhead of parsing and right after that, executing this JavaScript code and uh, compiling it to native. So a couple of practices are, of course, minification and dead code elimination. This is something that we have been building in the Angular CLI and introduced even its, uh, its, for its uh, early days. So we are already doing minification. We are eliminating all the dead codes after ahead of time compilation. And uh, we are making sure your apps execute as fast as possible. But something new that we have been working on together with Manfred from the community to uh, introduce, and which we are going to introduce as part of version 8, is differential loading. So this is a feature that I'm particularly excited about, especially because of its performance uh, benefits and our users who are on modern brow browsers, they are no longer need, have, have to pay the penalty for shipping just getting polyfills for older browsers. So here is how differential loading is going to work. We are currently building two, ty two times your application, once for older browsers and once for newer browsers. We're going to build ES5 bundles for your users who are on legacy browsers and ES2015 bundles for users who are on bleeding edge browsers. So uh, there are a couple of benefits of this. First of all, we need to ship fewer polyfills, right? And on top of that, we will not have to down level the modern syntax, which is not only going to make your bundles smaller, but it is also going to make them faster to execute because, well, the JavaScript engine can take advantage of the more expressive and more powerful syntax which has been introduced recently. We noticed some performance improvements uh, in a couple of applications, and uh, we, by very early measurements, we can see that we're shipping about 65 kilobytes less polyfills and from 2 to 10% more bundles or even more. This depends completely on how modern syntax, how modern and expressive syntax you're already using in your application. Here is how differential warning works. So first, the browser sends, of course, request to the server. The server delivers the HTML, where there are two script tags, one for modern browsers and one for legacy browsers. From there, the browser, depending on its supported capabilities, it chooses one of these script tags, it downloads the associated JavaScript, and right after that, executes it. That's it. Here is how the index.html file looks like. Here are the two script tags. One of them is with type module, which is associated with the ES2015 bundle. And we have a script tag with attribute no module. This is just a hint for newer browsers to not download this bundle if they already have ESM uh, ECMAScript 2015 module support. So why did we choose differential loading instead of doing some magic on the server? Well, first of all, it, it simplifies deployment a lot. The browser makes the decision which, which bundle to download, and uh, we don't have to couple our server with any complicated logic which is related to parsing the user agent and deciding what JavaScript is supported by the user's browser at all. And on top of that, there is a proposal which aims to make differential loading a first-class citizen in modern browsers. 
So this is still very early stage. It may even not ever get standardized, but it's pretty exciting to see that people are working in this direction. So currently with differential loading, we are restricted to in shipping two different versions of JavaScript, ES5 and ES2015. With this new standard, we will be able to ship multiple JavaScript versions so that the browser can download the most recent one depending on the support syntax it has. Uh, as I mentioned, we're going to introduce this as part of Angular CLI version 8. You can already experiment with this feature with our RC2, which is on NPM. So yeah, please give it a try and let us know how much we, shr we shrunk your bundles. How you can control differential loading. So we have two properties in the Angular CLI which allow you to set the minimum supported version that you would want us to ship to provide for you and the maximum one. You can set the target in tsconfig.json to ES2015, and you need to set the minimum browser support, minimum supported browsers in your browser, uh, browser list in order to make sure that you're shipping ES5 so that your application is not only compatible with all the older browsers, but also uh, SEO friendly. All right, so now let us go to even more exciting part, which is code splitting. Code splitting is, in general, one technique which is a subset of larger set of practices called lazy loading. With lazy loading, we just ship the minimum amount of assets which are required for the user at a given point. You might have seen this on Medium, where you see pretty much all the images which are currently visible in the viewport. And once you start scrolling, more and more, visible, more, and more images get visible, get downloaded from the server and visualized in the browser. So, Two, the two specific practices for lazy loading JavaScript are component level and route level code splitting. With component level code splitting, let's say that we have a very heavy e-commerce platform, which has an even heavier widget, chat widget there, like chat support widget, which is something like Slack in the browser. And we know that only about 2% of users engage with this user, only about 2% of users are actually using it. So does this mean that we'll have to introduce this part of our initial bundle so that everyone is paying for the price of this widget, even though they're not using it at all? No, we can just lazy load it. We can put a placeholder there. And once the user starts interacting with this widget, we can send a request over the network. We can download the corresponding JavaScript and bootstrap the chat widget completely. So this has been a little bit hard to achieve with the Angular View Engine, but there are a couple of modules, community modules, which are going to let you do that. For example, we have ngx loadable, which on about 2.2 kilobytes of JavaScript will allow you to do that. We also have lazy AF <laughs> from uh, Aaron Frost, who developed this widget, uh, this module, and uh, it's providing uh, the, same, the same functionality, so it's pretty much depending on your own preferences which one you're going to use. Both of them are uh, well developed. Route-level code splitting. So this is something that I hope pretty much everyone is already doing it, right? How many of you are using route-level code splitting with the Angular router? Right, I hope, I hope uh, I'll encourage you to use it even further around right now, because this is probably the most efficient way to shrink your bundles. With route-level route uh, code splitting, we can have our, let's say in this case, our article feed page our article list page. So once the user opens the articles list, they're only, going to go, they're only going to download the articles list module, so the JavaScript associated with this particular page. And once they navigate to settings, let's say, they're going to download the settings module. That's it. Pretty simple. And we can already use this in Angular by using the load children syntax, the load children property in the route declaration. In version 8, we want to enable more, we want to take advantage of modern standards, so we, want, we enabled uh, dynamic imports, which can let you do pretty much the same thing, but by using the uh, ES2015 module syntax, dynamic import syntax. But there is one problem with lazy loading. It introduces some latency between navigations because the browser needs to go, to go to the network, download the associated with the page JavaScript, and bootstrap it. On slow networks, this could be quite annoying. And that's why we are actually building single page applications because we want to provide a very responsive user interface. And by introducing this latency, well, we are not going in the right direction. 
So here I have throttled the network and introduced 3,000 uh, milliseconds latency so that when the user clicks on the settings page, they'll have to wait for three seconds until anything gets visible. So as you can see, that's not ideal experience. And depending on the user's connection, this could be, the experience could be even worse. That's why we have techniques such as prefetching. With prefetching, in the background, we can download the JavaScript associated with pages that we suppose that the user may need next, and just after that, provide them from the browser's cache once the user actually uses them, when, once they navigate to these pages. So there are different strategies for achieving prefetching or preloading. For example, in Angular, we have the preload O strategy, which is going to preload all the different modules in your application. But of course, if you have hundreds or even tens of modules, this might be not the most efficient way, because you're going to drain the user's data. And on top of that, you may even block the main UI thread. So that's why we usually try to be precise in what we are prefetching. We want to prefetch only what is supposed to be used next. And I've noticed that as developer, I usually try to guess what the user is going to use and do next, uh, similar to this way. Just I'm trying to put myself into the user's shoes and trying to guess where the user may supposed to go, but they usually don't do that exactly, I think. So there are a couple of more efficient prefetching heuristics that we can use instead. For example, we can prefetch only the visible links on the page because if the user is going to navigate somewhere, it's very likely that so that they click on a visible link, right? We can use predictive prefetching. This is something that I'm particularly excited about and I'm going to discuss in a little bit. Or we can prefetch a link, like the JavaScript associated with a specific router link, on mouse over. Let's start with fetching the visible links first. So let's suppose that we have this blank page, which has a bunch of links. Uh, we have a modern API called Intersection Observers, which is going to allow you to observe an element. And once this element becomes visible to a certain percentage, we're going to get an event so we can perform an action. So here, for example, we are scrolling down this page. Team gets visible, so we are downloading the associated JavaScript. Contact and about gets visible as well, so we do the same. This is a valid preloading strategy that you can use with the Angular router today just by installing the ngx quick link module. Right after that, you need to introduce it as part of your routing configuration in your preloading strategy. And finally, you need to import the quick link module from ngx quick link introduced in your imports and exports in your shared module. So I'll definitely encourage you to take a look at this module, but sometimes it can be a little bit too aggressive in terms of prefetching as well. Imagine we have a Wikipedia-like page where from one page particular, we can go to 100 others. So does this mean that we're going to download 100 JavaScript bundles? This might be quite inefficient also. Well, we may even never prefetch the actual JavaScript that the user is going to need because, well, the browser can just fetch maybe five or six, can process uh, five or six single origin requests per time at a given point. Instead, we can use predictive prefetching. So this is related to a project that was announced on Google I.O. last year uh, by, from the Chrome team. So we have been working with them quite actively in order to provide predictive, like predictive, uh, mach even machine learning driven user experience with uh, a tool called GuessJS. Basically, we can consume your data from Google Analytics. We can download your Google Analytics report. After that, because we're getting individual pages and how the user navigates between them, we need to map them to actual JavaScript bundles corresponding to your routing declaration. From there, we can build a Markov chain or a recurrent neural network, depending on how fancy we want to be. Just, this is just a predictive model that we can use at runtime in order to guess where the user may go next so that we can prefetch the associated JavaScript. Right after that, GuessJS bundles a tiny piece of JavaScript in your main bundle. And once the user starts navigating across the application, we are predicting where they may go next. So we go to the network, prefetch this, and push it into the browser's cache. We can think of it in the following way. We have this Wikipedia-like application. We have tens of links on it. And based on our Google Analytics data, we can rank each individual link. 
So we can give it a cost, and depending on how, co how high its cost is, we can preload only the ones which are very likely to be visited next. So this is still in an early preview, although we can also already give it a try with Angular. It's uh, available on GitHub at github.com slash guestjs. So yeah, this has, been, this has been some very cool things, like differential loading, lazy loading. Uh, we are using predictive prefetching. We're using some statistical models in order to predict where the user may go next based on some heuristics. But uh, in the same time, if we just have a broken import, we can drag half of node modules as part of our initial bundle, and we can completely destroy the user experience. So that is why we have performance budgets in the Angular CLI. The performance budgets are going to let you set constraints and set the, minimum, the maximum bundle size for your application. So this way, if your bundle size exceeds the limits that you have set, your build is just going to fail, and it is not going to let you proceed. This is a great opportunity to introduce performance budgets as part of your CI so that you can track each individual PR and what is the cost of your PRs on top of your bundle size. I'll definitely encourage you to take a look at um, performance budgets. And uh, we have documentation on, the, on Angular I.O. in the build section for the CLI. All right, so there is one more thing that we have been working on in order to make sure that we, you're shipping very fast web applications. We noticed that there are some very low-hanging fruits that people are usually not taking, taking advantage of. For example, more than 27% of Angular applications are not using content compression for their static assets. For example, for SVG images or JavaScript. And even higher is the percentage of Angular applications which are not using CDNs. And CDN is a, an extremely convenient way to provide your static assets from the most geographically close location to your users. For example, in the US here, if we're building application for our users in Europe, we can just directly push them to the CDN edge there, and uh, our user's latency is going to be much lower compared to downloading these assets from the US. In order to encourage people to use these practices even further, we're working very closely with cloud providers in order to provide automated deployment from the Angular CLI. For example, this is a demo of using Angular CLI with Firebase, with Angular Fire, which is going to allow you to have automated deployment. Here, we're first adding the Angular Fire module to Angular CLI version 8, the RC. This is going to download the Angular Fire module. This is going to do some modifications in your configuration files. It is going to download a few other dependencies, such as Firebase tools, let's say. And right after that, it is going to show a prompt so you can pick your Firebase hosting project where you would want your application to be deployed to. Once you run ng run, the name of your application colon deploy. We're going to run the production build of your application. Here, we're going to do all the magic of uh, ahead of time compilation. We're going to do tree shaking. We're going to get rid of that code and minify your code in the most efficient way we can. Uh, once we're done with this, we're going to delegate the execution to Firebase. So Firebase is going to take your static assets and directly deploy them to Firebase hosting. Finally, we're going to provide a URL where you can preview your application directly. As I mentioned, we're working very closely with Google Cloud for Firebase hosting. We're working very closely with Azure. Since recently, we're talking to AWS, Netlify, and Zeit. So we are going to provide you a way to deploy your applications to any platform convenient for you. And on top of that, based on the Angular's Builders API, you can implement deployments to your favorite cloud platform if there are already existing builders for this purpose. So just a quick recap. Today, we saw how we can reduce the bundles of your applications by using differential loading. <coughs> Excuse me. After that, we discussed how we can use lazy loading per component or routing level, and how we can use preloading or prefetching by, based on quick link or predictive prefetching with guess.js. And finally, we saw how we can deploy your applications automatically from the CLI and make sure that you're following best practices so that your users are going to get the best possible experience. Uh, that was it, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>